Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Ephraim Kam, and I'm from the INSS. This session is expected to deal with global strategic concerns. The idea behind this uh, concept is uh, simple. We have noticed that this conference is focusing mostly on Middle East issues, on Israeli concerns, yet there are other concerns, global concerns, beyond the Middle East. Some of them are not linked to the Middle East, like global uh, economic uh, problems, like uh, the rise of the right-wing uh, radical movements in Europe. Some of them are emanating from the Middle East, like the Iranian problem, or the rise of radical Islamic movements in the Middle East, but the influence is going much beyond uh, the Middle East. We want to discuss some of these issues. For that matter, we have invited very distinguished guests that are sitting on the, uh, here. Uh, let me introduce each of them briefly. First, uh, Ms. Uh, Jane Harman. She is the director, the president, and the chief executive officer of the Wilson Center in Washington. Before that, she serves nine terms in the Congress, in which she served in all the major security committees. I have to say that originally we planned to have here Ms. Mary Beth Long, the former uh, assistant secretary of defense in the U.S., but unfortunately she, is, she, she doesn't feel well and she couldn't come. So we asked yesterday uh, Ms. Arman to join us in this panel, and we are grateful to her for agreeing to, to uh, join here. Then we have, uh, well, I think I have, to, I have to take a long breath before I'm, I'm reading his names and titles. We have here uh, Air Chief Marshal Lord Graham Eric Jock Stirrup. He's a member of the House of Lords in the British Parliament, and most importantly, he's a former Chief of Defense Staff in, in Great Britain. Then we have, uh, to my right, Ms. Dr. Michael uh, Fulilov, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy in Sydney, Australia. And finally, we have also Francois Bourg, his Special Advisor at the Fondation Pour la Richesse Strategique in Paris. Before that, he was the Director of this Institute and the Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies uh, in London. Uh, so we have uh, two Europeans, one American, one from Australia, two Asians. We miss one from Africa, and I'm not joking. I think Africa has also to say something about uh, global concerns. Our moderator now is today is Yaakov Achimeir. All of you know him from the television. He's leading, a leading Israeli uh, journalist, and he's a current affair editor and presenter in Israel's public uh, Channel One television. Yaakov has been awarded the 2012 Isra Israel Prize in the field of communications. The award is handed out by annually by the State of Israel and regarded as the state's highest honor. I shall ask Yaakov Achimeir to handle this panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ephraim Kam, and good morning to you all. Uh, I believe that I'm the only Asian in this uh, group. You mentioned the Europeans, the Americans, and myself, of course. Uh, good morning, lady and gentlemen. The Middle East, in spite of the lack of stability and the violence, is a major focus and, of, and point of interest. In order to examine problems and issues which occupy nations and power outside the region, we would like in this session to examine central issues which are not related directly to the Middle East. And I think that we can examine these issues by focusing on the changes in the status of the great powers. I suggest that we start with examining the influence of the United States. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, America has faced many significant confrontations in Afghanistan, the renewal of violence in Iraq, the issue of nuclear Iran, and the efforts to achieve a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And my question is, do you feel that the U.S. finds it's more difficult to use its military power in order to achieve a global order? Ms. Jane Harman, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, 
I, I want to say to my friend Amos, I'm not sure if he's sitting here, I would travel the world to be in a conference with you. I think you are an uh, enormous gift to humankind and clearly a major leader, maybe even a future major leader in, in this country. I also want to say that I am not Mary Beth Long. Uh, she might have given you uh, a more interesting presentation this morning since she did work for the only agency of the United States government that thinks strategically. Uh, and uh, strategy is the point of this panel. Uh, I, w more later as we get into that, but I, I do think, uh, unfortunately, that most parts of our government think tactically only and that that is a problem for the United States. Uh, on this issue, um, yes, uh, I think most people would acknowledge, certainly our military would acknowledge, that the use of kinetic power uh, has its limits and that as the U.S. seeks to project power in a very changed world, we should use more of what we call a whole-of-government approach, which includes diplomacy, development, uh, and the support of non-governmental institutions, NGOs, and public-private partnerships, and where we use those, we are more effective. I just want to make one other comment, uh, and maybe this will come up later, too. Uh, the world is very different from 1989. It was a bipolar world then. Uh, it is, was then thought that maybe we would have a unipolar world with the U.S. as the sole superpower. I would argue we have a multipolar world, and that the best role for the United States now is as an indispensable partner. And if you think about that across the world, I think that is a way to think about how the U.S. should project power using a whole-of-government approach that will be more successful. Uh, uh, Ms. Herman, you called the United States a partner rather than a leader in world issues. Why? Well, I think we should lead. Uh, I think we should help to form partnerships uh, in which we are a member. But I think assuming that we are the sole superpower, that we can project kinetic force and get our way is, uh, is wrong. I think if there ever was a time for that, that time has passed. And as we discussed yesterday, many other powers in the world, certainly including China, are rising powers. And as we find our way in a, in a very dangerous world with the enormous and, it seems to me, metastasizing threat of terrorism, uh, we have to find strategies that will work. And I think the best strategy for the United States is to, is to be everybody's indispensable partner. Uh, do you believe, uh, Ms. Herman, that uh, this is one of the characteristics of the Obama era now? Yes, I think uh, he has stressed um, working uh, with partners uh, around the world. I don't think he has explained himself uh, and, and his policy as well as he could. And the narrative for the United States is missing in this region. Uh, Steve Hadley said it very well yesterday. We have to project our values and our interests, and he explained what those were. And I don't think we have done a good enough job of explaining those. And those values and interests, it seems to me, align with the interests of Europe, uh, with the interests, in most cases, of Israel. Um, we could talk about that. Uh, but certainly of uh, many countries. And in fact, I think our value, uh, well, certainly our interests align with Russia in a place like Syria, and maybe even align with Iran, which has been the victim of chemical uh, uh, gas, chemical gas attacks in the 80s and is still suffering from that. So I, I can see a way that the U.S. could explain itself better and, and it would make our policy as the indispensable partner more effective. Uh, thank you very much. I'll come back to you, of course, later in the discussion. To my left is Lord Graham Eric <laughs> Stirrup. He asked me to call him Jock. Please, okay. <laughs> Member of the House of Lords, UK Parliament, former Chief of Defence Staff. Good morning, uh, Lord. Uh, sorry, good morning, Jock. Uh, do you agree with the explanation of Ms. Harmon about the role of the United States? Uh, yes, I did. I mean, I think, first of all, if we're going to talk about power, we have to understand what we mean. 
and generally I think when we talk about power in the international sense, we're talking about the ability to, uh, uh, to get others to follow courses they would not ordinarily of themselves follow. Um, and if that is the case, then the basis of nearly all power in that context is economic strength. It underpins just about every, every facet of power. Uh, and there is no question that the uh, United States remains an overwhelming economic power. Uh, and although, it, you know, like many countries, it's had some difficulties in recent years, to the outside observer, most of those difficulties seem to be political rather than economic. The fundamentals of, uh, of the United States economy remain you know, very, very strong. Uh, what has changed, of course, is that the economic strength of China has risen um, in comparison. So uh, I agree that uh, because of that, the United States is no longer in a sort of preeminent position compared to everybody else in the world, but it is in a very, very powerful position. Uh, but of course, when you talk about the exercise of power, it's not just about you know, military operations. That, you know, kinetic operations are an important element in all of this, but that you have to be uh, subtle about how you use your power. You have to be flexible. Uh, you have to be uh, agile because those who are seeking to oppose your power, uh, if they've got any sense, will not come at you in your areas of greatest strength. They'll try to exploit your areas of, of, of weakness. So one has to think about this in those kinds of almost military terms, even when you're operating well beyond the military spectrum. So I think at one stage in the United States, the term smart power gained a, a sort of temporary vogue. Well, these are all buzzwords, and I'm, I'm not sure that they're all that helpful, but being smart in your application of power, being flexible, being adaptable in the face of all of those that are seeking to oppose you is enormously important for all of us. And I think that uh, I certainly see that um, in the way that the United States is going about its business. I think that there is just a danger in all of that that we start to think that the use of the military instrument um, has really uh, run its course. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, in my view. It remains an absolutely fundamental part of that array of tools that you need, need for the successful exercise of power. Uh, but, Jock, you are a former military leader, military prominent uh, military commander, and from your, your own experience, Jock, did you feel that the United States, military speaking, is trying to distance itself, military, in areas of confrontation like Afghanistan. I believe that uh, the UK is a partici military participant in the war in Afghanistan. Uh, what is the role of the US, military role, from your own perspective, from your own experience? Well, I, I, the, the, the short answer to the question is no, I do not think it's trying to distance itself. I mean, I can't speak for the United States, but that's certainly my, my perspective. But you have to understand that when you are involved in somebody else's country, um, you are in many ways in a race against time. Because you know, no matter how welcoming and friendly that country is at the outset, basically countries don't like um, foreign troops on their own soil. Um, and there may be a slight lesson here in the context of this region. Um, and even if they're willing to accept them at first, you know, the, that acceptance erodes quite rapidly over time. So you're in a race. You're in, you're in a race against time to get the indigenous forces in a position to be able to look after themselves before you run out of consent totally. Now, in Afghanistan, it seems to me, and you've only got to look at the remarks of President Karzai, the consent has pretty much run out. So, you know, we, we have to transition now to an alternative way of providing security for the Afghans. It can no longer rest upon the shoulders of foreign forces on Faringi. Um, so I think that it's absolutely the right strategic and tactical move. But I, uh, I mean, I think there's a misunderstanding here. I, speak, I, I will speak for the UK and not for America, obviously, but there is certainly a weariness amongst the publics in terms of campaigns that involve putting a lot of boots on the ground for a long period of time in situations that do not, uh, uh, do not allow you to be able to claim a clear-cut victory. Success or failure is a very difficult thing to measure and can really only be judged in a historical context. There is a lack of appetite for that at the moment. It doesn't translate into a lack of appetite for military operations, just that kind of operation. 
And even that is, in my view, not likely to last um, forever. Uh, you know, when you come to the end of a marathon, you really don't feel like running another one right away. But it doesn't mean to say you've given up running marathons. So I think we have to look at things in that context. But all countries are going to judge where they should apply their resources and their forces, depending upon the context of the moment, not upon some sort of general principle. Uh, and in the context of the moment, the demands are elsewhere. Uh, and in Afghanistan, the requirement is of something different. Thank you very much. Uh, our next guest is uh, Dr. Michael uh, Folelov, Director of the Global Issues Program, Loy Institute for International Policy in Australia. Uh, Dr. Folelov, from your perspective, the involvement of the great powers, I mean China and the United States, in your region, how do you see it? Well, first of all, uh, let me say it's, it's wonderful to be back in Israel and it's great to be at INSS. You may have guessed from the, the name of my institute, the Lowy Institute, that there's some fraternal association between INSS and uh, the Lowy Institute. And uh, I'm an, a, a great admirer of INSS and what Amos has done with it. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I mean, I agree what, with what my colleagues have said. I think that uh, state's ability to operate in the world depends on their strength and their will. I think the stre America's strength, its military strength, is mainly undiminished. It's the only country in the world that runs a truly global foreign policy. Uh, it spends as much on military as, as the rest of us combined. It can project power anywhere on earth. But in terms of its will, there are question marks. There's a palpable war weariness in the country. And there is a sense, I think, of the country turning inward. A lot of people in the Middle East say, um, that America is pivoting away from the Middle East to focus on Asia. But from the perspective of someone who lives in our region, I would say that the pivot is less than it appears to be. Uh, I personally think that the pivot has run out of puff. Um, the security outlook in Asia is much less predictable than it has ever been. It's, of course, it's not on the scale of the Middle East. but. Um, Although there's no tensions uh, on the Taiwan Strait now, you have a lot of problems on the Korean Peninsula, including a madman running North Korea. You have all sorts of tensions between China, Japan, um, South Korea and other countries in the East China Sea, the South China Sea. And the US role as a, as a guarantor of stability, as an ally of countries like Australia, and as a balancer of China is critical. Um, Chinese foreign policy is very interesting, I think. Um, there's a very uneven quality about Chinese foreign policy. The leadership has remade China's economy. They have driven vast productivity increases, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Their military capacities are now mirroring their economic capacities. They have a strong hand to play but it is not clear how they will play that hand. There is a dualism to Chinese, the way China comports itself in the world. Sometimes it's slow to claim its influence, sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it's cautious, sometimes it's strident. Sometimes it's pleasant to deal with, sometimes it's prickly, and it's never quite unpredictable. And it's in that context of um, a, a world where wealth and power are shifting eastward toward my part of the world, where you have a rising power that is a far greater challenge to the United States, in my opinion, than the Soviet Union ever was, where you have rising nationalism, you have many strong states operating in a very national interest-based way, in a very 20th century way, where the US role is critical. And that's why I supported the rebalance when President Obama announced it uh, to the parliament in Canberra in 2011. But that's why, contrary to what most of the people in this part of the world think, uh, I have doubts about the uh, impressiveness of the rebalance. Uh, there is a new government in Australia under Prime Minister Mr Tony Abbott. Can you give us a, a vision or a forecast what will be uh, the conduct of the new Australian uh, uh, government towards what you called, or as I understand it, the Chinese enigma. The 
Chinese enigma, did you say? Yes. Well, um, You're, you were very doubtful, if I understood you correctly, about what China will do, what China, how China will conduct itself, I mean, on one hand, on the other of hand. Of course. And so I think, um, I think the United States and Australia, for that matter, need to be strong with China, um, but not belligerent. And I think the, the, the balance that America has to strike is of being present in the region and assuring the balance of power in the region without, because if you don't, then China will see that as a, a lack of resolve. But equally, if America overplays its hand, um, then we could have very dangerous and escalating rivalries in the region. And that's why I think the American presence is critical. And that's why, although it's wonderful that Secretary Kerry is putting so much effort uh, into this part of the world, uh, we, we feel the absence of Secretary Clinton. Now, in terms of uh, Australia, um, we have a new government, which is a conservative government. I think its emphasis is on bilateral um, ways of dealing with the world rather than multilateral ways of dealing with the world. Um, it, uh, I think um, it will be strong on Australia's traditional alliances with the United States, with Japan. Um, Mr Abbott has said, for example, that Japan is our best friend in Asia. We don't know how uh, Australia will how the Abbott government will react to China. A little while ago, China declared an air defence identification zone over some disputed islands in the East China Sea, and uh, the Abbott government uh, strongly criticised that. It got a lot of it got a lot of um, criticism in Australia for that because there's a real live debate in Australia about how we should conduct ourselves in the world, how we balance. Um, our relations with the United States, our great strategic ally, with China, our greatest economic partner. This sort of strategic triangle is appearing all over Asia. But myself, I think it is right that when China, re China behaves in a way that is unpredictable or, um, or uh, um, belligerent or unwise, I think it's appropriate that Australia stands up stands up for its values and interests because I think ultimately China respects clarity and I think usually concessions made to a rising power are not reciprocated. Maybe Israel has some experience in this. Usually they pocket it and ask what's next. Whereas I think if you deal with China in a straightforward way with clarity and with respect but equally you say where your red lines are as well as their red lines, I think you can reach a modus vivendi. Thank you for the moment. Uh, our next guest is uh, uh, Mr. Francois Heisbourg, uh, Director of uh, Research Strategic Institute in, in Paris. What is the UA perspective of uh, perception of the American policy? The EU, I'm ah, sorry. The EU, so sorry. The, the, we're not yet part of the African Union, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, was, I was wondering about that, although we do, sp do tend to spend a bit of time in Africa these days. Uh, uh, first of all, the European Union for the moment has one concern essentially which is about saving itself, saving its single currency, and there's very little energy, political or otherwise, uh, to, deal, uh, to deal with uh, other issues. Uh, uh, the energy which is left to deal with other issues tends to be concentrated at the national level, not at the EU level. And here you do see some, I think, uh, positive developments, uh, notably with the, the relaxation, uh, uh, the positive uh, evolution of relations between France and Israel, uh, the uh, uh, very strong stance taken by a number of European countries, Britain, France, Germany, uh, in the handling of the Iran account. Uh, 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 but you are not going to find this at the collective level, uh, mm -hmm. simply because a collective level uh, is a wall, has gone, is, is doing something else. And you, and you see this, for example, in the handling of the Ukrainian crisis, which is very much on our doorstep. Uh, but uh, uh, you would be hard pressed to find uh, major and strategically significant statements by either Monsieur Hollande or Monsieur Cam Mr. Cameron uh, or uh, Frau Merkel uh, on the crisis uh, in, the, in, in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hollande is busy with other matters now. Uh, pardon? 
I say that Mr. Hollande is busy with other issues. Now. Well, you know, I, I, I never thought that he would emulate President Kennedy uh, in, <laughs> in, in this particular sphere. Uh, uh, the looks are not exactly the same, but it, but it does seem that they're, uh, but they're, so, that they're quite similar extracurricular activities. Uh, but to speak seriously, uh, uh, we in Europe ask ourselves exactly the same question that you are, and which uh, my friend Michael uh, has been asking, how real is the American pivot to Asia, and what does it mean? Uh, one of the advantages of dealing with the United States of America is that the Americans usually say what they mean, and they mean what they say. I take the pivot at face value. I think the Americans uh, are entirely straightforward and honest when they say that their major strategic concern is about the handling of the relationship with a rising China. In that sense, the pivot is entirely real. Whether the Americans handle the pivot in the most uh, clever manner, whether they invest adequate resources, uh, whether Curry is doing this uh, less well than uh, Mrs. Clinton has been, that's, that's, another, that's another issue. Uh, uh, but the pivot is there. And the question here becomes, what does this mean for Europe, and what does this mean for the region? For Europe, it's quite clear. A, uh, Europe is way down on America's list of priority. Does this worry me in itself? The short answer is no. After all, uh, Europe is not, I touch wood, for the moment, a, a source of major strategic concern and instability. Uh, so why would the Americans be investing militarily, politically, very heavily uh, in, uh, in Europe? But it also means that we are in a situation where we have to respond to a tougher strategic environment, because the Middle East is not getting any kinder to us as it is to you. Uh, the Arab revolutions uh, uh, may carry some promise in some places at some time, but for the moment they tend to carry more problems, more instability in most places most of the time. Uh, there is another consequence of the pivot to Asia, uh, one which is not immediately apparent, but it will become apparent at the first major crisis in East Asia. And that is the Americans will assume rightly but possibly wrongly, that America's allies in Europe and in the Middle East will not undercut American policy in East Asia, precisely because East Asia is of the essence to the US. The Americans will not take kindly to us saying stuff or doing stuff which would be seen as inimical to American interests. Israel has some experience in this field. Uh, when you have tried to do things in China, which the Americans did not appreciate, they fell on you like a ton of bricks. Uh, this is something which the Europeans uh, have not experienced on a daily basis, but it will come. And because the EU is China's number one trading partner, this, uh, many people tend to forget, we are the number one trading partner uh, of China in both directions. Uh, that means that China is in a position to apply political and diplomatic pressure on us if the balloon, well, the balloon goes up, that's a, that's, those are str two strong words, but if a serious crisis breaks out in East Asia and where we are compelled to choose between the Chinese interest and the American interest. In that sense, the pivot is essential to us as it is to you. I would like to put uh, to you, uh, Monsieur Hesburgh, you asked me to call you François, but it's yeah, rather François, difficult yeah, for you, François, yes. François. A typical Israeli question, a typical Israeli question. I'm an Israeli, and I believe the audience, of course, is an, uh, combines of Israelis. Why the EU? You, mentioned, you spoke about China, you spoke about uh, East Asia, about America. Why the EU is so much deeply involved in the issues of the Middle East, especially in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict? Yeah, that's a... Uh, a a, a in, typical in, question, by uh, No, no, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a fair question, uh, but, but my answer would be the following. 
uh, it's also an oriented question uh, in cinematographic terms. Uh, what the camera sees depends on where the camera is located. Uh, what you see is the EU's attention vis-a-vis -vis your part of the world, logically enough. Uh, but uh, in the greater scheme of things, uh, if you look at it from the European side, uh, the EU is essentially a commentator, a more or less ill-advised or well-advised, depends on days, depends on issues, a judge of things which are happening in this part of the world. It is not an actor. It is not an actor in the sense that the US is an actor. It is not even an actor in the sense that Russia is an actor in this region. Uh, what strikes me is the weakness of the EU's influence, the, in, the EU's action in this region. I set aside commentary on uh, whether the EU's judgments are well taken or not. Uh, speaking as a Frenchman, I, would, I have, have rather more sympathy for the attitude of my government when it comes to the handling of the Iranian dossier or to the relationship with Israel which, has, which is today better than it has been in many, many decades. And uh, 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 the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique handles the track one and a half strategic relationship between France and Israel. So we, uh, I'm, very, I'm very much part of that machinery, and it's great to see that happening. And I find this much more reassuring than the default mode of the European Union, which is judgmental. It's judgmental be precisely because the EU is not an actor. If the EU were an actor, it would be much more careful. Its granularity of analysis on what is going on here, whether, whatever the issue, whether it's the, whether it's the separation barrier, whether it's settlements, whether it's the peace process or so on, uh, I think we would be much more careful and much more constructive if we were an actor rather than sort of sitting in semi-detached judgment. I thank you for the moment. I'll, to sum up this uh, chapter in our discussion, I would like to sum it up with a question to you, Ms. Herman. Do you sense that the United States is heading towards a policy of isolationism in the broad sense of the word? Um, Your mic, please. I, I think some people in the United States, including in the United States Congress, in both political parties, are increasingly isolationist, but as a whole, the U.S. is not becoming isolationist. I think there is war weariness because both of the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been long wars, and in many points in those wars, mistakes were made in how they were prosecuted uh, and whether they will in the end turn out to be viewed as successful. I didn't say victories, but successful, or whether as Dave Petraeus said, uh, progress will be proved at the end of these ventures is, is still a question mark. So my answer to that is no, but if I could, I would like to disagree a bit with what I've heard from both colleagues to both sides of me for a minute. Um, the U.S. Uh, pivot, according to most people in the administration, is uh, an unfortunate name. It really was intended to be a rebalance. And uh, I don't think the U.S. is or can leave the Middle East or is or can leave Europe. Uh, I think what's going on in Asia is a focus, again, on, on the United States becoming a partner in the region with uh, all the countries there, Australia being way high on the list, who are friendly, all of whom have major trading relationships with China. Uh, the U.S. has participated vigorously in ASEAN meetings. President Obama personally has gone to those meetings. So in some ways, I think he personally is invested. He's also had a part of his childhood in Indonesia, uh, in Asia. And uh, uh, Secretary Hagel has been there numerous times. Uh, we've also put troops, a limited number of troops, in Australia at Australia's request. Um, we have a robust counterterrorism policy there. We have staged disaster relief to many countries in Asia through our military, which has been a very effective foreign policy tool, and we are pursuing vigorously a trading regime, the TPP, uh, in Asia. And so I think for all those reasons, uh, the U.S. is rebalancing the relationship with Asia. 
Uh, in terms of the EU or, the, or Europe and, and Israel, uh, let me make a comment as the uh, daughter of a Holocaust survivor. I think Europe has a moral obligation to be connected to Israel. Europe failed the Jews, um, not intentionally in many cases, but Europe failed the Jews and they came here. And many, many people in this country uh, have roots in Europe. And I, I think, it, speaking personally, uh, that, that to say that it is uh, in, in a more detached way that there is a relationship and it might be better if the EU were in charge of it, I think is, is um, less robust than, than it should be. Thank you. We mentioned uh, China, the Middle East, uh, the Far East, East uh, Asia, and uh, now we come to, to Russia, a joke. I think that Russia is under Mr. Putin is pursuing a rather aggressive uh, policy in comparison with uh, the United States. How do you see it? Uh, well, first of all, just a brief coda on the previous discussion here. We've been talking about is the United States going to do more of this and less of that. And, uh, last night, Dave Petraeus asked Amos what kept him awake at night. Uh, it was uh, a, a British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who, when he was asked what, what worried him uh, most, he said, events, dear boy, events. Uh, and I think, you know, we have to bear in mind that people respond to events, and we're pretty bad at uh, forecasting what sort of events are going to transpire. Mm -hmm. So we should, I think, bear that in mind. With regard to Russia, um, I mean, it seems to me, I'm, I'm not a, you should have had John Scarlett, who's a real expert on Russia, I'm, I'm not. But um, Russia, under President Putin, seems to be following... Um, a very similar course, uh, not to that which it followed as part of the Soviet Union, but uh, to that which it followed under the Tsars. Um, there, is, uh, there is a very sort of autocratic uh, feel about the place, uh, and there is that kind of uh, foreign policy that you saw in, in that particular milieu. Um, but, I mean, Russia um, is pursuing what its leader perceives to be its national interests. So is it pursuing a more aggressive policy towards country A or to, towards country B? Well, again, I think it depends. I think it depends on how the leader judges uh, Russia's national interests at that particular moment in time. But I think we have to remember that Russia faces some really, really serious problems. Uh, and I think we've, while we, we shouldn't be complacent about Russia, uh, neither should we be unrealistic. Um, it has really serious structural, financial, and economic issues. It has really serious demographic issues. Um, it's, those issues are going to be compounded if the uh, overall global cost of energy reduces significantly, which is at least a, a reasonable possibility in, in the near term. So Russia faces some really serious problems of its own. But part of those problems are about um, its, uh, its own periphery and those countries just beyond its own periphery. Uh, in Russia, southern Ru Russia, in southern yeah. Russia. Yeah. Well, southern Russia with regard to its own um, uh, uh, Muslim population, of course, uh, but also, I mean, Russia has historically, and under the Tsars historically, saw the Ukraine as an important buffer. Um, and so it's no surprise that we see Russia trying to make sure that the Ukraine does not move closer to the European Union, but is ever more closely bound to, uh, to Russia. Um, and, you know, its, it's recent uh, uh, offer of a, a, a very large bailout um, is all part of that policy. But uh, as I've seen various commentators uh, remarking in, uh, in recent days, that's likely to prove a Pyrrhic victory for Russia because, um, you know, you can't buy someone once and then believe that you've got them for all time. I mean, in the, in, in the sort of usual terminology, you don't actually buy countries, you rent them, and you have to keep paying the rent. Uh, and Russia can't afford to keep paying the rent for Ukraine. So I, I think that there are, um, there are some amazing inconsis inconsistencies um, within, and dichotomies within Russian policy, uh, and we've got to look at those very carefully. But can we expect Russia to be um, uh, very activist in those areas, particularly around its periphery, where it sees its uh, vital national interests affected, such as in Syria? Absolutely. I, there's no surprise about that. Uh, do you envisage uh, that Russia will uh, be involved militarily in the domestic issues of Ukraine? Uh, I think that's 
unlikely. I think that's very unlikely. Um, I'd never say never, uh, but uh, it's, it's hard to envisage the circumstances where that would occur at the moment. Um, I think if it did, it would, be, it would be awful for Ukraine. It would be utterly disastrous for Russia. Um, so I think the chances of that are pretty low. Mm -hmm. uh, Francois, how do you see the future of the uh, events in Ukraine? And the background, of course, is the close connection of uh, the willingness of the Ukrainian uh, public, speaking in general terms, to, to, to re-establish or establish relations with the EU. Yeah, uh, the, there is some good news here. The good news is that I think Ukra the Ukrainians want to continue to be Ukrainians. That is, despite the linguistic and historical divide between Eastern and Western Ukraine, there is no willingness on the part of the Ukrainians to play the game of division, of a partition. Uh, it's a risk, but uh, I don't see the forces today in Ukraine which want to see that risk occur. Paradoxically, I think this is the one issue on which the Russians and the Europeans will also agree. I agree with Jock that the Russians are unlikely to intervene, uh, not because uh, they wouldn't have wanted to under, under other circumstances, but that what the Russians are hoping for is maybe some sort of return uh, to Tsarist era relations. So the, the stakes are very high indeed, uh, and Putin certainly has been very clear about how important the events in Ukraine are for Russia. And for us, of course, they are also therefore very high. Whether Russia stays the nation state which it decided to become when Mr. Yeltsin removed it from the Soviet Union in 1991, or whether it tries to go back to an imperial dispensation, uh, that of course has tremendous consequences. But Moscow, even if it has imperialist pretensions, will not want to see a divided Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And once you put these two things together, what I've just said, uh, there is some hope that this will go in a manner which is despite the lack of will of the European Union to play a substantial role, despite the lack of cleverness and adaptability of the European Union, uh, that at the end of the day we will have a situation in which the forces of democracy and freedom will win in Ukraine and that Ukraine will remain in one piece. But they will owe it to themselves rather than to the outside world. And maybe that at the end of the day is, is the best possible thing uh, that could happen. Do you believe, uh, Francois, that it is a wise move by some Western leaders like President of, uh, Hollande, Prime Minister Cameron and other, and Merkel, to boycott the Sochi Winter Games? Uh, I think they were uh, wise uh, for those who did so a few months ago to say that they would not go, because this was not correlated specifically with the situation in, uh, 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 in Ukraine. Of course, uh, yes. The mode, the, 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 uh, the mode of governance in Russia, the manner in which various minorities are dealt with in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, the choice of uh, uh, the site of the Olympics in a region which is geopolitically and geostrategically about as smart as having the Winter Games in the Hindu Kush, uh, 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 politically, why would our presidents or chancellors or prime ministers go to Sochi. This, after all, is only a sporting event. This is an event for sportsmen. Yes, for but it is a, ma a major international event. It's uh, not only a sporting event. President Putin is seeking a seal of approval. And the question is, should we give him a seal of approval? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer of, the instinctive answer of most of our leaders is, if that's what he wants, he's not going to get it because there's nothing to approve of. Uh, if it were simply a question of common courtesy, like in Beijing, then yes, we should go. Mm -hmm. 
But this is not about a simple courtesy. This is about Putin literally seeking a seal of approval. Mm -hmm. And I, I, don't, I don't see why we should give it to him. I see. And Ms. Harman, uh, President Obama will not go to Sochi, will boycott at least the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. Well, I, don't, I have never heard the word boycott associated with uh, President Obama not attending. I, I agree. I, I, President Putin has not missed an opportunity to stick his thumb in the eye of the United States in the last several years. And so I, 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 I'm not surprised that there is not a warm, affectionate relationship between him and President Obama. But I agree with the problems in the world. I, I, I would f fault our president if he went to the Olympic Games right now. He did in his State of the Union message last night which I stayed up to hear. I may be the only deranged person here, but I, I am a recovering politician and it takes a long time to get over it. Uh, but at any rate, he did salute the athletes going to Sochi. Um, I would make a comment about the Ukraine because I, I do think it's a very interest, the most interesting part. Uh, well, the Middle East is the most interesting part of the world, but next to the Middle East, Ukraine is Especially up there. Especially in Tel Aviv. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Anne Applebaum, who is an astute writer and married to the foreign minister of Poland, uh, wrote an article the other day in which she said that the Orange Rev Revolution was overrated and we misunderstood. We thought that that was a fast transition to democracy in the Ukraine, and it wasn't. And I totally agree with Francois's comment that when, if when the Ukraine changes, it will be a Ukraine solution. And it hasn't really changed yet. It's a long evolution, much like uh, the countries, the neighbors in, in this neighborhood. Um, I also think in terms of Russia going into Ukraine, I don't think Russia's experience going into Georgia worked out so well. And I think that this is a place Putin will not go. And finally, I was on a panel in Davos the other day with Alexei Pushkin, who is the chairman of the Duma Foreign Affairs Committee, and we were talking about Afghanistan. And he said, without blinking, Russia will never go back there. And so I think Russia has learned some lessons uh, about uh, uh, experience with its neighbors. And just finally, though, um, Russia does have interests in the Middle East. I don't know if this exactly was your, your question, but Syria owes Russia $10 billion. Uh, for one thing. Secondly, Russia has a there is a strategic naval base in Syria that Russia uses. So in that sense, Russia has an interest in, in Syrian stability. But I would say, as I hinted before, that uh, despite the fact that they keep defending Bashar, Russia's interests would be better served if they uh, were supporters of a transition process in Syria. Thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, we should dedicate the last chapter of this discussion to global uh, terrorism. And uh, I would like uh, to ask you, uh, our guest from uh, Australia, do you feel that the West is well prepared to combat global terrorism? Um, well, let me come to that in a sec. Do you mind if I just respond to a couple of, very, very briefly, to a couple of the issues? My friend Jane. Um, uh, I guess defended the, the, the strength of the US rebalance. And I guess I'd just take one minute to explain what I meant when I said I think the pivot has run out of puff. Um, the, the problem is that if you go around Asian capitals, most people will say what I have said. I think when Obama announced the rebalance, uh, the Chinese were worried. And now the Chinese are not worried anymore. And the reason, it, the reason is that, that um, the reason it's hard to take the Americans at their word on the rebalance is that the military elements are underwhelming. 1,500 Marines in Australia doesn't make a big difference one way or the other. The diplomatic elements are underwhelming. Um, but most of all, I think, I think we have concerns about the ability of the American political system these days to really rebalance its foreign policy. I mean, if Obama is serious that this is that Asia is where America's opportunities and challenges are, then we would expect to see presidential concentration on this. We would expect to see real resources employed. And yet, even at the presidential level, and I agree with Jane that I think Obama believes in the, in the rebalance in a way that I don't think John Kerry does. But even there, when Obama went to um, the UN last September, um, he didn't mention Asia. He had to cancel important visits to Asia at the end of last year. Why? Because 
the congressman was shutting down the government over a, a normal sort of budgetary issue. And I think this is a concern that we have as an ally of the, the United States that, that the genius of the US system is breaking down and the ability of America to, to make decisions um, and then to invest resources in order to achieve the outcomes that they're trying to achieve that we have seen in the past, that seems to be breaking down. And that applies not just on Asia, and I don't want everybody to think that, that we only think about Asia in our part of the world. Um, it, it applies to American behaviour around the world. And we talked about isolationism before. America's never going to become isolationist like it was before the Second World War. It's, it has global interests and global engagement. And yet, and yet, it was very disconcerting for me um, when Obama was considering taking very limited military action in Syria. First of all, that he found it so difficult to get support from Republicans. Republicans! That uh, you had Tea Party Republicans, you had Rand Paul out there at the top of the, uh, the presidential rankings. Uh, the Republicans weren't standing up. I mean, it, I mean we looked to mainstream Republicans so, to provide... Sorry to interrupt you, Michael, yeah. but I believe that President Obama vetoed a possible French military action in Syria. Well, I was going to come to Obama, but I thought I'd just start, thought I'd be balanced and start with the Republicans. But, but on Obama himself, the sort of dance of the seven veils that he conducted over Syria was a bit disconcerting. I mean, maybe, maybe the military action was, was right, would have been right, maybe it would have been wrong. But what I thought was odd was that he foreshadowed this very limited military strike. He then blinked. And he then decided he had to go to Congress. Um, and, and in the end, maybe the chemical weapon deal, maybe that was a good outcome. But, but I was struck that that was, a, that, was an, a, that was a decision that many presidents would have taken beforehand without consulting Congress. And I don't want to offend a former mm -hmm. Congresswoman here. And then shortly after that, the British government uh, also uh, made a similar decision, and even the French, I think. And, and it seemed to me that there was a, a, a loss of will on the part of key Western capitals here, in Washington, in London, in Paris. And so I don't think the West is becoming isolationist, but, um, but I don't know uh, how much appetite there will be for forward-leaning action. I, don't, I, I didn't agree with the invasion of Iraq. I'm not talking about that sort of thing. But a strong, um, united West is important. Mm. Uh, Francois, I believe, is very eager to react to yeah, my remark uh, about uh, France and uh, Syria. And the Syrian. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't over-read uh, uh, American uh, reluctance. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm too optimistic. Uh, what we saw in Washington and London last August uh, was the consequence of two words, Iraq and Afghanistan. Why were the French gung-ho? It's not that we're Prussians. It's not that we want to go to war on every occasion and opportunity. Uh, you know, we're supposed to be the cheese-eating surrender monkeys. Remember that one? The axis that was of the last decade. The axis of weasel. Uh, uh, why, why were the French militant and the others weren't? Uh, well, because we didn't go to Iraq. Because we, we didn't need to explain to our public opinion that there are occasions when war is warranted and other occasions when it's unwarranted. The Americans and the Brits had to live down what they had tried to sell their public opinions in 2003. So uh, why, do, why do I come to the conclusion, therefore, you may, you may ask, uh, that uh, uh, the US is maybe not on an isolationist road? Well, simply because this, this uh, retraction this lower profile of the US, I think, is deeply linked to a specific event. And that specific event is essentially about Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but otherwise, precisely because America does have global interests. I mean, what you said, Michael, it has global interests, it has global role, it has global capabilities, and therefore, my assumption is that the Americans are entirely serious about the, 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 the rebalance and the fact that they've rebalanced the rebalance, if I can uh, 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 use another play on words, is because uh, of the manner in which Mrs. Clinton uh, actually overplayed the rebalance. Because what happened when the pivot was announced? Pivot was Obama's word and then that was changed into rebalance. 
uh, uh, pivot was not invented by outside observers. It was, it, uh, Obama actually did use that word. Uh, uh, well, what happened? You immediately had the Filipinos who decided this was a good time to do a provocation in the South China Sea in order to uh, draw in the Americans and to cement the American defense commitment to the Philippines. You saw the Vietnamese starting to speak into the eye of the Chinese and talking about a strategic relationship with the United States of America. So when, the, when John Kerry uh, came on and saw uh, how things were going, that when, when, when I was running the risk of building up a second alliance system in East Asia, and that maybe it was beginning to look a little bit like pre-1914 Europe, that then the Americans sort of cooled it and uh, 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 rebalanced, uh, rebalanced, rebalanced. Does that mean that the US-Chinese relation ceases to be less important strategically? The answer is no. This is obviously the primary American concern. This is the pivot of America's strategic interests in the world is how will the relationship be managed? Thank you. I did not uh, forget my original uh, question. Is the West well prepared for uh, to combat uh, global terrorism, Joe. Uh, well, I, I will move on there just very briefly to say that um, I broadly agree with what Francois said, although we should remember that we did actually intervene in Libya post Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I think you know, one of the problems was that, uh, as one commentator put it, uh, Secretary of State Kerry's proposition in Syria seemed to be come out with your hands up or we'll hit you with an unbelievably small strike, which didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, uh, but, I mean, turning to the issue of, of global terrorism, um, I don't know actually what you mean when you say global terrorism. Do you mean uh, a ter an organization that has a coordinated global campaign yes. of terrorism yes. Yes. to achieve a single yes. unified end? Well, we, we are talking actually, about, for instance, about the network of Al-Qaeda. Well, but that's the point, you see. I mean, there, is, there are elements. There are, there, there are a bit of Al-Qaeda, particularly now, I think, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula that still pursues that particular agenda. Although we should remember that the original and still, I think, overriding objective of Al-Qaeda is actually to overthrow the Al-Sauds in Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, that was, you know, what it was all essentially directed at. Um, but most of these other um, terrorist organizations uh, and uh, terrorist campaigns that we see are campaigns of long-standing. They are disputes of long-standing that are particular to that region. Um, they have adopted the Al-Qaeda uh, brand name, the franchise, because it gives them a certain mystique and also because it does provide not a unifying global credo, but a sort of underlying, it's a bit like sort of free flow of, of labor and capital within the European Union. It provides a bit of a free flow of expertise uh, and in some cases fighters between different regions. But in most cases, their agenda are regional. Uh, their, their grievances are particular to themselves and they're pursuing those grievances which they have pursued for a great many years in the same way that they always have, but now under an Al-Qaeda banner. So I think that is, is, is distinct from the globally unified campaign directed at a common strategic goal, which I think is, you know, is pretty much now focused on Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So I think you do have to distinguish between uh, those two things. I mean, do we have the, uh, do, do we have the right approach to deal with um, a, a wide swathe of campaigns that use terrorism as, it, as their principal tactic, because that's essentially what terrorism is, it's a tactic. Um, uh, you know, I think we're not doing too badly, to be quite honest. I think we should not undersell ourselves. You know, we have, um, uh, we have some significant issues in the UK because we have nearly, um, a, uh, nearly a million UK citizens of Pakistani family origin. And so, you know, with the upheavals in Pakistan, uh, we, you know, they get sort of transmitted into the UK through that particular community, most of whom are absolutely uh, upright, law-abiding uh, UK citizens. But of course, they have this close connection with their homeland. But we have to remember why they're living in the UK and not in Pakistan. They're living in UK because in the UK, they have a much better life than they would if they live in Pakistan. So what do we have to offer? We, well, actually, we have to offer an enormous amount to these people. And you know, we're in danger of underselling ourselves. I mean, there has been a lot of talk over the years about the battle of ideas. I mean, it is, in, in one sense, a battle of, of ideas. But, but you know, 
we're, if, if we're not careful, we're in danger of forfeiting a battle that we've already won. It's quite clear that um, you know, the Western values that, that we espouse, um, you know, that uh, Steve Hadley was talking about yesterday, provide people with much better lives than the alternatives. That's why they come to our countries. So I think that we're very well equipped. I think that sometimes we just uh, have a lack of self-confidence. We need to be much better at it. Thank may, you very much. May I applaud that yeah. uh, comment, but add a few more things. Um, number one, uh, here is a place where I think President Bush and then President Obama have been very successful. They really have destroyed the core al-Qaeda elements in Pakistan and Afghanistan that led to 9-11. But what came after that was a horizontal uh, franchise system where many people are appropriating the al-Qaeda name, although they are not al-Qaeda. I, I totally agree that this is a disparate group of folks. And one of the ironies, actually, is that Hezbollah, which does operate um, as, as a proxy for Iran, is a Shia organization. And Al-Qaeda and most of the others are Sunni organizations. So watch out for the, the clash of civilizations in some near time frame. Uh, but, but to build on this comment and to come back to the original question about uh, uh, kinetics, uh, we can't. Um, play whack-a-mole and, and expect to win, win the confrontation with terror groups. Terror is a tactic. Uh, we have to win the argument. And the way we win the argument is, number one, understanding and being confident about the fact that so many Pakistanis and others want to live in the West. But number two, projecting our values. Uh, one of the other things that President Obama said last night, and I applaud him, I know how hard this is, is that he is going to close a, a Guantanamo Bay prison this year. It's not the first time that he makes such I a I know, problem. but I think he said it more carefully, having had the experience that he's had over five years. Uh, and if that happens, that removes a black eye in terms of America operating by the rule of law. I believe that we have to conclude our uh, discussion. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. I hope it was very beneficial to our audience. Thank you very much indeed. And <laughs> Dr. Ephraim Kam would like to make some remarks after this discussion. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, Jacob. In, in order to conclude this uh, session, I want to make a few brief uh, comments. First, we discussed in length today and yesterday the perceived uh, weakness and perhaps decline of the American influence in certain parts of the world and especially in the Middle East. And I think it raises additional, two additional uh, questions. One, to what extent does the American perceived weakness might encourage uh, Russia to increase its influence and intervention in certain parts of the world, especially in the Middle East? And my answer is, is positive. Remember how, Russia, how the Soviet Union penetrated into the Middle East in 1955 following mistakes done by Western governments uh, toward, toward Egypt. And today, Russia is already an important player in the, with regard to the Syrian crisis, with regard to the Iranian issue. Russia is the largest supplier of arms to, uh, to Iran for the last uh, 25 years. And uh, uh, Russia is also making an effort to penetrate into Egypt. Remember, see what happened. The Egyptians are very much an angry at the American administration following its intervention in uh, Egyptian domestic affairs, following, especially following its uh, decision to suspend part of the military assistance uh, to Egypt. And a few weeks ago, both the Russian Minister of Defense and the Russian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, together for the first time, uh, came to Cairo with a file of projects uh, suggested to Egyptians, including a proposal of a large arms deal uh, with Egypt. And this is, I have to remind you perhaps, uh, for the last 40 years, the Soviet Union and later Russia have not supplied any arms uh, to, to Egypt. So this is a change in the Russian behavior in this regard. And secondly, following the, I would say, the problematic nature of the military intervention of the United States in Iraq and Afghanistan, and before that the Russian, uh, the Soviet and Russian intervention in Afghanistan as well, is this could lead to the end of uh, intervention, military intervention on the part of the uh, superpowers in, in other countries. Uh, obviously, the cases of Iraq and Afghanistan limit the freedom of actions of superpowers. 
and the United States is not in a hurry to intervene in Iran or in uh, Syria because of Iraq and Afghanistan, in part. But this is not necessarily the end of the story. Remember what uh, President Obama said, uh, military operation in Iran is still uh, an option. See what uh, General Petraeus say, said here yesterday, it, is, it can happen. So I would say it can happen under certain circumstances. And this brings me to another question which has not been discussed so far. The problem of failed, failed states. This is a relatively new problem. There is more attention drawn to this problem for the last uh, few decades. And it, it refers to uh, failed states in which the government, the central government, does, wrong, does not control the entire territory of the state, does not uh, supply the basic services to the population, does not uh, prevent uh, foreign players from inter uh, intervening and penetrating into the country. And the outcome is that all kinds of uh, armed militias, uh, radical elements, uh, terror organizations, crime organizations are building their strongholds and safe havens in these in this, uh, states. And this is, this is a global problem, but the focus of this problem in the is in the Middle East and the periphery of the Middle East. Remember Syria and Iraq and Somali and Lebanon and Pakistan to some extent and part of Egypt in Sinai Peninsula. And this is a growing problem, which might perhaps, if it, there is no solution to this problem, I would not rule, the rule out the possibility that foreign countries, the superpowers, will have to intervene militarily in order to prevent uh, this problem. Because at this moment, they are forcing, focusing, this organization are focusing on domestic uh, struggles. But a day might come in which they might send the operators to other countries, to moderate Middle East countries, to Israel perhaps, to Europe, and perhaps even be beyond Europe. This might be, I would say, a bombshell which could explode sometime in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe that the next speaker is the president.